All right, so welcome everyone. We are getting started. Um, hello, my name is Sinan Du, and I am the KIPAC Outreach and Engagement Manager. Uh, welcome to another KIPAC Public Lecture. So KIPAC stands for the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. We are an astrophysics research institute here at Stanford, and um, we are so excited to actually present this lecture and many other outreach programs to you all. Um, so I can see some familiar faces here. Welcome. And also welcome those who are just checking out us out for the first time. Um, so, okay, great. I'm there. Um, means everyone can see me. Uh, okay, wonderful. So this is my absolute uh, pleasure to actually introduce today's speaker, Johannes Lange, to you. So Dr. Johannes Lange is a postdoc researcher here at Stanford. Um, he was born in Germany um, and he has also studied physics and astronomy at various places around the world, including Europe, Asia, and in the United States. Um, he got his PhD from Yale University uh, before joining KIPAC as a Stanford and Santa Cruz Cosmology Fellow. Um, in his research, he does cosmological simulations to actually study the distribution of matter in the universe on very large scales um, that would help us further understand how galaxies uh, work and also um, furthering our understanding of cosmology. So you might see that or hear some of the terms there, but don't worry, uh, later it's all going to be explained and hopefully you also enjoy uh, Johannes' talk today. Um, Great, so before we get started, I would also like to quickly introduce those who are supporting this event, but sort of behind the scene, because some of you may know this is actually a hybrid event and we have a larger group of audience um, also on YouTube. Uh, so to start with, I'm going to introduce my virtual co-host, Renee, who is going to be helping with communicating during the event. So Renee. Hi, I'm Brene Hatna. Um, I'm the KIPAC data curator and storyteller, and I'm really happy to be here helping you all have a great virtual experience. Great, thank you. Um, aside from Brene, there are also a few chat moderators um, who are going to help with the live chat and trying to get to every single questions um, that we get online. Uh, these chat moderators, they're all subject matter experts working on very closely related uh, fields um, related to today's topic. And I will also quickly let them introduce themselves. So first we have um, Simon. <laughs> oh, Simon, you may want to unmute yourself. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, my name is Simon Beer. I'm a Kavli postdoctoral fellow and I'm looking forward to be with you in the chat. Thank you, Simon. Um, next, we have Josephine. Hi, everyone. I'm Josephine and I'm a rising third year graduate student. Um, I study radiation processes and pulsars and I'm very excited to help answer your questions today. Well, thank you, Josephine. And we actually have one chat moderator joining us in person today, Richie. Um, channel, everyone online, see me? Nope, not yet. Uh, not yet. A little bit more. Okay. So, go. hi, everyone in person and uh, online. I'm Richie. I'm a third year PhD student here in KIPAC. I work in the same group as Johannes, um, studying dwarf galaxy formation using simulations. And I'll be on the chat soon. Great. Thank you, Richie. And last but not least, we have Nick. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nick Cochran. I'm a fifth year PhD student, also working in uh, the same research group as Johannes. And uh, we do very, very close research for neighboring office mates we talk uh, very often. So I also work on these cosmological simulations and what we can learn about dark matter and dark energy by running them. Wonderful, thank you all. So for all of you who are joining us in person, 
Uh, the Q&A will be at the end of uh, the presentation, which is about 40 minutes. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to save them towards the end. And um, you will also get to talk to Johannes once this event ends. Um, and for all of you uh, who are joining us online, you will see that we have the YouTube live chat there. Um, and feel free to ask any kinds of questions or even you wanna start a discussion, feel free to do that. Um, since we have a pretty large crowd on YouTube, we just kindly ask you to be respectful to each other. Most of the questions will be answered by the chat moderators as they come in. And we will also save a few of those to be addressed at the end of the event during the Q&A. So um, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Great. Set this up. Right. All right, um, thank you. Wow, thank you everyone for coming and thank you everyone online. Oh, right, <laughs> I was asked to move those. <laughs> okay, I think now we're fine, right? Okay, great. All right, so um, astronomers like to spend enormous amounts of resources and brain power on simulating entire universes on the world's fastest supercomputers. And so in this talk, we're going to talk about some of the science behind all of this. Um, so I know that some of you will probably already know quite a bit about this topic, um, but I was curious to know what could my audience possibly already have picked up about this topic um, by reading, for example, major newspapers. And sure enough, the topic of cosmological simulation is one that does occasionally pop up in major news outlets. So um, for example, um, there are some excellent headlines in the 90s, um, one from the New York Times reading, a computer model suggests gravity shaped the universe. Another one also from the New York Times, 96, computer enlists Einstein's enigmatic force to explain the universe. And that was already almost 30 years ago. And these computer simulations got ever more powerful and more detailed, and it became harder and harder to explain the details of those to the general public and so instead, many of the headlines concentrated on the sheer size of these simulations. So one headline reading, this is the most accurate simulation of the universe ever. But still, this was almost 10 years ago. And as these simulations got more and more powerful and more detailed and more complex, we started to wonder, are we living in a simulated universe? Here's what scientists have to say. And this is a headline from NBC News. And this is what kind of dominates the scientific um, or the discussion about cosmological simulations in newspapers nowadays. So just a very recent headline that I found was Elon Musk cites promise evidence that we're already living in a simulation. Okay, so I'm gonna explain some of the science behind all of this, but I'm an astronomer. I will concentrate more on the, the first three headlines and only briefly talk about this more speculative aspect of whether we ourselves are living in a simulation. So um, in approaching this, I wanna answer three very broad questions. Why, how, and what? First, why do astronomers simulate the universe, right? Why do we spend all this energy and brain power resources on what could be described as just expensive computer games? Then I'm gonna talk about some of the details of how do we run cosmological simulations what are we actually simulating? And what are the kind of tricks that we use to make these simulations detailed and large? And finally, the most important question is, what are we actually learning from these simulated universes? What have we already learned about our place in the universe from these simulations? And what do we hope to use them for in the future? So that's what we're gonna talk about. Let's start with the why. Why do we simulate the universe? Well, it really goes back to what makes astronomy the oldest science, right? This kind of question that we sure all ask ourselves when we look at the night sky. We ask ourselves, why are we here? Why are there all these stars, galaxies, planets, black holes, etc.? So scientists have a very specific way in going about this question, 
And that's kind of summarized in this quote here by Edwin Hubble. He says, we don't know why we're born into this world, but we can try to find out what sort of world it is, at least in physical aspects. So basically, instead of asking the why, we first have to understand how the world works. And in the process of understanding how the world works, we might get closer to understanding the why. Now, physicists describe the world in the language of mathematics, in so-called laws of physics. And I'm sure you are aware of some of those laws of physics. A very famous one is Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, basically telling us that mass and energy are related and can be converted into each other. And this is the kind of law of physics that powers stars, allowing them to uh, fuse hydrogen atoms into helium, releasing large amounts of energy in the process and enabling life here on Earth. Uh, similarly, another very important equation is Einstein, the one underlying Einstein's theory of general relativity. So Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that space and time are not separate entities. They're instead uh, one and are often described as space-time. And so this equation here, which is really beautiful from a physical perspective, but a bit hard to understand without a physics degree, basically tells us that the presence of mass and energy uh, spend, uh, bends space-time, and this is what ultimately gives rise to gravity. Now, these are only two of several laws of physics that we know about. The important point is that we assume that those laws of physics are true everywhere and at every point in time. We assume them to be true in this room in the same way that they're true somewhere else on Earth or even in a far, far away galaxy. And similarly, we assume that they're true both today as well as just a few moments after the Big Bang. And so by assuming this, we can make testable predictions. Basically, if our laws of physics are true um, in the way that we assume them to be true, then they should naturally give rise to the universe that we observe today. And this is where simulations help us. They allow us to simulate universes where all these laws of physics are true, are valid. And so we can ask, well, if we simulate such a universe with these laws of physics, does that result in a universe that looks like the one that we can observe? If it does, well, then maybe our laws of physics are correct. If it doesn't, that means our laws of physics are wrong. And that's basically the scientific principle. It allows us to, the simulations allow us to make experiments. So that's the, the general idea of why we run cosmological simulations. There's a second aspect or why it is particularly appealing to run these cosmological simulations in astronomy. And that is this lucky circumstance that we have what can be described as the baby picture of the universe. This is the, the cosmic microwave background or CMB. Um, it's basically the afterglow of the Big Bang. It's a near isotropic radiation in the microwave sky. You can see it everywhere you point your telescope at. But I say near isotropic because there are tiny fluctuations in the temperature map of this cosmic microwave background. And this is one of the most accurate maps that we have of the CMB uh, recorded by the Planck uh, space satellite. And you can see these fluctuations and they, they appear random. And in some sense they, they are, but they're still governed by physics. So let's zoom in a bit further. Um, you can probably see here that a lot of these fluctuations in the temperature map, they occur on specific sizes. They all tend to have roughly the size of, let's say, this, this red dot here. So astronomers analyze this in detail, and they can uh, calculate uh, what is known as the temperature power spectrum, of the, the CMB. This looks like this. So you can see in teal are the different measurements. And you can, in fact, see that most of these, um, that there, there are a lot of fluctuations, they peak at an angular scale of around one degree, which is roughly the size of the red dot I was showing you. And through all these measurements, you can see it goes a red line. And that is a physical model of what we think the universe looked like at the time that the CMB was released, which was 400,000 years after the Big Bang. 
Now, there's a lot of really exciting physics going into this curve and fitting this curve. But we don't have time to go into this here, but I just want to leave you with saying that um, by fitting this curve, by analyzing the temperature fluctuations in the CMB, we have a very accurate idea of how the universe looked like when the CMB was released, which is 400,000 years after the Big Bang, basically at the, almost the very beginning of the universe. And it turns out that the universe at that point in time was a very different place than it is today. So as I said, at the time of the CMB, the universe was a mere 400,000 years old. Nowadays, of course, the universe is around 14 billion years old. Also at the time of the CMB, the universe was around a factor of a thousand times smaller than it is today. Today, not only is the universe much bigger, but we see that it is getting, uh, that the expansion of the universe is accelerating uh, in, in speed, something that we attribute to dark energy. Um, also, at the time of the CMB, the universe was very hot. It was around 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit on average, whereas nowadays, the universe on average is a very cold place, actually. Uh, it is around minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit, just a few degrees above absolute zero. Now, this might surprise you because obviously here on Earth, it's much warmer and the sun is really hot. But in the grand scheme of things, scales of the universe, the Earth and the solar system is a really unusual place. There are large amounts of space there where there's basically nothing. And finally, at the time of the CMB, the universe was a bit boring. There was just, it was a, a soup of hot plasma. Now there were some places where there was just a few percent more hot plasma, some place where, some place where there was a few percent less, but overall it was, there was not much to see. Nowadays, of course, we have all these different phenomena, right? We have stars, galaxies, and black holes, uh, galaxy clusters, all this. So the important question now is, do our laws of physics correctly predict this transition from this early stage of the universe all the way to today? And again, this is what we do with simulations. We, uh, we answer this question. Can we make this transition from the CMB to today? So how do we actually go about simulating entire universes? Well, the first thing to realize is that the universe is complex. There are lots of phenomena and there are different scales, right? There are scales of galaxies in between galaxies. We're talking about hundreds of millions of light years. But there are also microscopic scales, the scales of quantum mechanics and atoms. And it turns out we can never hope to simulate all of this in one coherent simulation. Instead, we have to make certain approximations. So let's think about what kind of approximations we could make. Uh, keeping in mind that we want to simulate the universe on the largest scales. So we we'll start by thinking about the uh, start thinking about this by looking at what the universe is actually made of, and you might have seen this kind of pie chart before, telling us that more than two thirds of the universe is something that we call dark energy. Turns out even we astronomers don't know what it is, but we think uh, we this is a substance we attribute the accelerate expansion of the universe to. Another 27% of the universe is dark matter. And again, we still don't quite know what it is. Um, we do know about existence because of its gravitational pull on other forms of matter, but we haven't really detected it. Only 5% of the universe is what can be described as visible matter. So it's stuff that you and I are made of, all the atoms and electrons, et cetera. So let's think about what kind of laws of physics would we have to put into our simulation? And the important laws of physics are those governing, governing how these different constituents of the universe interact with each other, and these are forces. Now, there are two kinds of long-range force that we know about in nature that could be of relevance. One is gravity, and the other one is electromagnetism, which also is what gives rise to light. So how these different constituents of the universe 
uh, interact by these forces? Well, first, dark energy. Again, we don't really know what it is, but it is what is responsible for the accelerate expansion of the universe, which is a gravitational effect. In all our leading theories, we don't think that dark energy interacts with electromagnetism. What about dark matter? Again, we don't know what it is, but we know of its existence because of its gravitational pull. So clearly it has a gravitational effect. But at the same time, it's called dark because we just cannot see it. And because it doesn't emit light, uh, we think also that it doesn't have uh, a lot of electromagnetic interactions. But of course, visible matter, that has both gravitational interactions as well as electromagnetic interactions. And in principle, gravity is very, very weak compared to the electromagnetic force. Right? You can very easily demonstrate this. If, for example, um, I'll take these, these two magnets here, right? I can, take the, I can put them close together and you'll see that eventually the, the one magnet is able to lift the other one off the ground. At this moment in time, this, this tiny magnet, its electromagnetic force is able to overcome the rotational pull of the entire Earth beneath it. So you can see in principle, gravity is super, super weak. But the point is that for gravity, all you need is mass and there's mass everywhere in the universe. For electromagnetism to occur, you need to have some net charge, right? You need to be either positively or negatively charged, but the universe on average is neutral. It means that every large object ultimately uh, tends to be uh, neutrally charged, which means it has no electromagnetic force. So on the scales of galaxies, it turns out that even electromagnetism for visible matter is not important or not that important. And so the main force that we have to simulate in these simulations on the larger scales is gravity. That's the most important force in the universe on these scales. So what I'm gonna show next is a video uh, from a cosmological simulation showing you how gravity shapes the universe. Um, you will see a timer at the, um, the top right corner showing you the time of the universe in billion years. It starts right after the Big Bang and Remember, today is 14 billion years. And this is a very, very large simulation. So uh, the simulation has like a few hundred bill, uh, um, million light years across. So just for reference, if the simulation had a galaxy, which it doesn't because it doesn't have like a it has no light. But if we were to put a galaxy in that simulation, um, it wouldn't even be the size of a single pixel in this simulation. All right, so let's start this movie. And initially, you really don't see much, right? And that's because initially the universe is fairly uniform. There's almost the same amount of matter everywhere. But over time, you can see you start to see structures, and that's gravity working. And that's because you happen to have some place in the universe where there's more matter. And because they have more matter, it has gravitational pull. And it attracts other matter around it, acquiring more mass in the process, and basically have a kind of runaway uh, reaction. You can see how over time, gravity leads to this, this formation of what astronomers call the cosmic web. It's this large scale structure of the universe, which kind of like looks like uh, a web. All right, so that's the, the idea of how this all works. It's an excellent simulation by um, colleagues of mine, Phil Mansfield and Meg Diemer. And um, so how do we actually go about simulating all of this? So it really goes back to the basics. And you might remember from high school, Newton's law of gravity, telling you that the rotational pull between two objects is proportional to the product of the two masses and inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. So if we wanted to simulate the universe using a large number of particles, n, n could be like a million or a billion or some really large number. In order to calculate gravity, we need to calculate the rotational force acting on each individual particle. Naive way to do this would be to go to the first particle and calculate the gravity with respect to all the other n minus one particles. And you repeat this for all of them. And overall, this would tell you, tell you, uh, take you n squared calculations. And maybe it's not, it's, maybe it's just what you have to do. And it turns out that if you do this, 
you could never run the kind of large simulations that we nowadays run. Instead, astronomers make an approximation. And that is by realizing that this gravitational force gets very weak once you're very far away from each other. And so they use an approximation that uh, is known as the tree curve. That's one of the approximations that we could possibly use. So I'm gonna tell you about, just explain to you how this tree code works. So this is like a, a sketch. Let's assume we want to calculate the gravitational forces acting on all these 22 particles. The tree code would first look at this box and divide it into four smaller boxes. Would note for each box, how many particles are in each box and what's their center of mass or the average position. And then it would continue dividing each box into smaller boxes until each box contains at most one particle. So here we would still continue because as you can see, every box has at least three particles. All right. Now, of course, some boxes already have zero, one particles. We don't divide them further, but those still have more. And now one last step, and now we're finished. Okay. So if you want to calculate the rotational force acting on, um, yeah, this one particle in uh, the top right corner. Well, there are these nearby particles, right? Those five nearby particles, they have a strong gravitational force. And so we really just should calculate this exactly. So we just do it. We just calculate those five particles, the forces. But what about those four particles uh, in the green box a bit further away, right? They're a bit further away. So the gravitational pull is not as strong. And so we can get away with making an approximation. Instead of calculating the force of these four individual particles, we just treat them as if they were one, right? That has four times the mass of the four individual particles and the average position, something which we already calculated before. And similarly, for the other particles that are even further away, we average them with even larger volumes. And so in this way, we can save a lot of computations. And if particles are really far away, we could just group thousands or millions of them together. And so with this kind of tree code, uh, you can run n body simulations with order n calculations, where order n calculation means some large number of times. But the important point here is that if you want to make, make our simulation 10 times bigger, it would take 10 times more computational power, not 10 times squared, 100 times more computational power, as with the naive um, way to do, calculate this. Okay, so this is uh, the there are several aspects to running big simulations. This is kind of the, the clever way of running big simulations. And there's a second aspect that is just brute force. We don't actually run these simulations on your average laptop or even high performance gaming computer. Um, we run them on, on supercomputers, but assume for a moment that we did run them on a, on a laptop. So I want to ask the audience, what would it take to run these simulations on laptops? So before I would even get started, I probably have to go to some store and buy some hard drives because these simulations are really large. There's a lot of data involved in them. So let's assume that um, a hard drive, typical hard drive is like a terabyte of data. How many hard, drive, hard drives would I need to buy to even think about running one of these state-of-the-art cosmological simulations? So people here can raise their hands and also people online, if they have some idea, can just post it in the chat. Pedascale. Sorry? Pedascale. Pedascale. So, uh, a petabyte, so like a thousand. Is that so? Like a thousand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some other? Somebody else has an idea? Okay, so it turns out a thousand is actually pretty close. Yes. So typically, yes, there's on a petascale that we need a quarter, a thousand terabyte or like a petabyte. So for this particular example, we'd need around 3,000 hard drives. So how would we? So once we actually have all this and I start, start running the simulation, how long would it take? If I would run this on, this on this computer right here, how long would I need to wait for the simulation to be finished? <laughs> Again, audience here can raise their hands and I can also, if you're online, you can also um, post your suggestions there. Somebody have an idea, just give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I mean, assuming that we're running like this on, on the best available codes. Thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. So one suggestion is thousands of hours. 
thousands of years. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's 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 way better. Yeah. It turns out. Um, yeah, you would need a quarter of a thousand years. Right? And that's because we don't run these on average computers. We run these on so-called supercomputers or high-performance clusters. This is one example, super next generation cluster in Germany. And there are tons of those around the world. They're basically farms of powerful CPUs all working together. And by employing thousands or tens of thousands of computers simultaneously on this problem, you can solve them within a matter of days or weeks, not thousands of years. All right, the third aspect to running big simulations is just time. Over time, computers get more powerful, which of course allows us to run bigger simulations. So the first cosmological simulation started somewhere in the 70s, but this plot here starts in the, the, somewhere in the 80s. You can see initially we were able to run simulations with like a few thousand to maybe a million particles. And that's one of the earliest plots, one of the, uh, the papers, one of the first papers running cosmological simulation. And you can almost count individual particles in this, in this plot. But these simulations continue to grow exponentially. Um, and nowadays we can run simulations of the order of trillions of particles. So we have increased them by a factor of around a billion. So they grow exponentially and become ever more detailed. And in fact, they're now so powerful that we can um, uh, drop some of these approximations that we need and reintroduce all the forces uh, that um, matter to, to visible matter. And so this is, for example, um, a simulation uh, called Lustrous that not only treats gravity, but also um, interactions relevant to visible matter. So we zooming in to this cosmic lab I showed you before. Now we change our view, we're looking at the gas temperature, which turns out to be very hot surrounding uh, galaxies and clusters. Now we're gonna switch to what astronomers call gas metallicity. Basically, as stars explode, they expel heavy metals into their surrounding medium. And finally, after zooming in by almost a factor of a thousand, we start to look at the light. See the still light and eventually, once we finish zooming in, we can see what appears to be a galaxy that looks quite like or very similar to our Milky Way. And so you can see all this, see all this, these detailed simulations and how they got more powerful over time. And again, you might wonder, are we living in a simulation? If you ask me this, I would say, I don't know. Like it's not, it's not my area of research. Instead, <laughs> I just wanna answer, could we simulate a universe that includes life? That's a very straightforward question. So astronomers like to measure, whatever reason, like to measure things in units of suns. Sun by definition is one solar mass. A human being turns out to be around 10 to the minus 28 solar masses. And an atom, 10 to the minus 57 solar masses. Now, even state-of-the-art cosmological simulation, they approximate the matter with particles that have masses of around a million solar masses, right? So even in state-of-the-art simulation, we're still a bit away from simulating even individual stars. So we really can't think of simulating life or even microscopic scales. Now, even though we cannot simulate life, which would of course be really cool, um, there's still a lot that we can learn from these simulations. And this is what I'm going to talk about next. So I mentioned this before and showed it before, and here it is again. These simulations predict on the largest scales, on the scales of hundreds of millions of light years, the universe should look like this cosmic web structure. That's basically a prediction. And this also what the universe turns out to look like once we actually observe it. So um, this is these are two plots showing the large scale structure distribution of the universe as seen from the Milky Way. And uh, each point here corresponds to a single galaxy. One plot is coming from the actual universe, measurement by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And another plot is coming from a simulated universe. And you can see it's basically impossible to tell them apart. 
But just for fun, who here thinks that the left one is the real universe? Just for a race of hands, C, okay, and the, the right one. Oh, wow, okay, you were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you really had no, no way to tell. Um, so, for all that we can tell, our simulations are remarkably successful in reproducing the large scale structure of the universe. But what about smaller scales? Now, when I talk, I talk about smaller scales, I mean scales of a million light years, scales of, let's say, galaxies or a bit larger. So we know from observations that, for example, by Vera Rubin in the 60s, we know that galaxies are embedded in a sea of dark matter or blobs of dark matter. And our simulations naturally produce those blobs or so-called dark matter halos. So that's great. But in the early 2000s, as our simulations got more and more powerful, we start to worry whether there might be a problem with our simulations, whether there's a small scale problem in our standard cosmological model. Now, one such problem is the so-called missing satellite problem. That goes as follows. So this here is an artist's impression of what the Milky Way would look like if we were able to observe from afar, which of course we can't because we're stuck here on Earth. But assume we could. Um, our simulations predicted us that this Milky Way should be embedded in a dark matter halo. That's great. Um, but again, as the simulations got more powerful, it turned out that the halo was supposed to look something like this. So not only was there this bigger dark matter halo, which extends basically the screen here, but embedded within that dark matter halo were smaller halos, so-called subhalos, so the ones halos of their own, but then got accreted by the Milky Way halo. And those smaller subhalos were also expected to host their own galaxies, so-called satellite galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. Now we knew about the existence of satellite galaxies, that was nothing new. And in fact, I'm showing here two of them, the large and the small matching cloud. The problem is that those simulations predicted there should be order a hundred or more satellite galaxies, whereas back then we only knew about around a dozen. So that was a problem which became known as the missing satellite problem. Now fast forward to today, and we actually think that we have solved this problem. It turns out that uh, these uh, that uh, these galaxies did exist, but they were much fainter than we assumed them to be. So it was very hard to actually detect them. So again, as I said, until the early 2000s, we knew about around, uh, about only around a dozen satellite galaxies. And they were identified by looking at photographic plates, basically photographs of the sky and looking at them with a the magnifying glass. Well, of course, we got more powerful telescopes. We developed CCD technology that were able, was able to capture much more light and also process them uh, much more uh, rigorously. And so for example, the Stonehenge Sky Survey increased that number quite dramatically. And with the more recent Dark Energy Survey, we increased that number to almost 60. And so nowadays we think that we have mostly solved this small scale problem of our science cosmological model. Now there's still some other ones, um, some of which we think we've also cracked, some of which we're still working on. Uh, so I wouldn't claim that we solved all of them, but I think it's fair to say we think there's some hope that we're able to solve all of them within our standard cosmological model. And so it's fair to say that even on these smaller scales, the simulations do a reasonably good job in, in explaining the universe. And so at this point, you might say, well, this is all great, right? We can simulate larger scales, we can simulate smaller scales, we can even form entire galaxies in our simulations, right? Now we're done, we don't need to run any more simulations. But of course, the science doesn't stop there. We're always trying to test our theories with new observations and maybe ideally even disprove them. And so that's what leads me into my last part of my talk. So there's a lot of things to be excited about in the coming years. We'll have new observatories providing more powerful data, allowing us to place ever higher scrutiny 
on the predictions of these simulations. Now, I want to talk about two of those observatories just as an example. Um, there is, for example, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, um, which uh, is uh, housed at the Kitt Peak National Observatory in the Mayal Telescope. You can see the dome here. And it's a very magnific magnificent instrument that is able to analyze the light of around 5,000 galaxies simultaneously in one go. And over the next few years, it will produce the most detailed map, three-dimensional map of the universe to date, and will allow us to probe the properties of dark energy. And similarly, of course, I have to mention the Vero Observatory, which will be finished in a few years. It will create the most detailed images of the night sky. And it will do so using a world record CCD, uh, which has 3,200 um, megapixels or 3.2 gigapixels. And it's being developed down the road at Slack National Observatory, basically here at Stanford. And so these are just two observatories out of many that we'll have in the coming years. And so we're really excited about the possibility of testing our standard model further. Another reason why we're excited is that we already start to see certain cracks of our standard cosmological model, even on those large scales that we thought were really successful. So um, we can now not only run individual simulations of the universe, or you can run large suites of cosmological simulations. So this is um, the Abacus Summit Simulation Suite, one of the leading suites of cosmological simulations, recently finished on the Summit supercomputer. You can see the almost like a, more than 100 boxes here. Each of those boxes represents one simulation of the universe that has billions of light years across and traces almost a trillion particles. And they all differ slightly. One simulation has a bit more dark matter. Another one has a slightly different expansion rate. Another one has maybe a bit different properties for dark energy. And we can then take all these simulations and ask which one looks the closest like the universe that we can observe. And when we do so, we start to see a problem. Basically, we can take the observations of the picture of the universe, the CMB, and take our simulations, pass it forward, and makes a prediction for how the universe should look like today, in particular, how, let's say, clumpy or how much structure there should be in the cosmic web. And we can compare this against direct measurements of the local um, large-scale structure. And if we do so, we find a, find a potential problem. So this is a, a plot I took from a paper I'm currently working on um, that, that's, that shows this. Um, so if we take the CMB and we pass this forward, then the, the clumpiness, or we call this S8, the clumpiness of the universe should have a value of around 0.83. Can see it goes down here, just for reference. But measurements of the local universe seem to infer slightly lower values for this parameter. You can see by just by just a few percent, so 0.83 is maybe like 0.78. You can see there are different measurements here coming from different publications. And I'm not going to talk about details here, just different ways to measure this. There's a lot of science behind this, involves like galaxy motions or gravitational lensing effects. But again, the important point is that there might be a tension. Now, I have to say, of course, this doesn't, hasn't yet achieved the level of a scientific discovery for which we would need this famous five sigma threshold. And there's still, we need to really understand both about the CMB and of our measurement of the large scale structure. But nonetheless, this and also a second tension known as the Hubble tension, which you may have heard about, um, tension, a similar tension arising in the expansion rate of the universe. All this has sometimes been called a crisis in cosmology. You can see astronomers like to be very dramatic and use these terms like problems and tension and crisis. But it's fair to say, actually, most astronomers are really happy about the prospect of this being real. Because again, we don't know what most of the universe is made of. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. 
we base our models on the, the simplest assumptions of what they could be. But if this model turns out to be wrong, well, then we need to revise it. And maybe in the process, we can understand better what dark matter and dark energy actually are. And so we're also running simulations that include alternative models for what dark matter could be, or what dark energy could be, or even how gravity behaves on the largest scales. So here's just one representative example showing you different simulations of alternative dark matter models. The common assumption is this cold dark matter model, which you can see on the, on the left here, but maybe there are different dark matter models, one called warm dark matter, another one called quasi dark matter. You can see they make very different predictions for how the universe should look like. And so that's what I wanna leave you with. Um, in the coming years, there'll be a lot of really exciting new observatories. Um, heard about DESI and Barry Rubin. You might've also heard about the James Webb Space Telescope. And those together with state-of-the-art simulations will help us understand what dark matter and dark energy are and thereby also help us understand our place in the cosmos. So thank you so much for listening. All right, cool. So I am going to stop sharing. And we are going to start with our Q&A. So anyone has any questions for you, Hans? Go ahead. Oh, I already spoke earlier. Okay. But how specifically would the James Webb contribute to your simulation? What specifically are the other projects that are planned? Mm -hmm. So James Webb um, is a space observatory designed specifically to analyze the infrared. And so it's particularly sensitive to galaxies at the very early um, uh, point of the universe, very early times. And so James Webb would particularly also probe the formation of the first galaxies and also thereby to some extent the formation of the very early structure in the universe. Great, question over there. Could you use the uh, idea of the cold, warm, and fuzzy dark matter. Can you just give us an idea of what different properties you're actually mm -hmm. talking about of dark matter? For mm -hmm. Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah, so I didn't actually mention this very much. So our leading theory is that dark matter is a particle, yet undiscovered elementary particle that doesn't interact very much by the electromagnetic force, as I mentioned. So in a simple model, this, this particle is, is very heavy and doesn't move very fast. Now in this warm dark matter case, um, it is a slightly lighter particle that moves around pretty quickly. And as a result, it kind of like washes out the structure that could be forming. And as a result, it looks more, fuzzy, it looks more, more blurred. The fuzzy dark matter is, is a really weird concept. It's basically a particle that's super, super light so light that it has quantum mechanical effects on cosmological scales, which is a really weird thing to think about. Um, but that's basically the, the major idea of how these different uh, models work. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, good, good. Okay, um, right here. So I'm curious, so you obviously, I think it's getting slow for you about physics derived models. I'm curious if you guys have looked into, I guess, machine learning or deep learning models and whether one is better than the other about expediting uh, computation time or giving more accurate results? This is an excellent point. Yes, uh, this is an active area of research. People are exploring to um, how we can use machine learning to potentially accelerate um, these cosmological simulations. Um, there are um, certain publications studying if, for example, just take the initial conditions from the CMB, we just ask a computer, a machine learning algorithm, like a neural network, how does it look like today without explicitly calculating all the force, just like directly tell me what it is. And that's the line of research that uh, may, might help us uh, make these simulations even bigger. Great, um, um, we'll save that for a, a little bit later. Um, we actually have some questions, great questions from the online audience. So there are a couple actually asking about the CMB, mm -hmm. the cosmic microwave background. <laughs> um, so one um, from Lou asking, uh, what actually produced the light uh, that we see in CMB and how do we measure that light? Ah, okay, oh. let me just go back to the map just so I can. Oh, uh, by the way, I already stopped. Oh, all oh, right, whatever, yeah, okay, okay. 
All right, all right. So um, my line of research actually not so much about the CMB, but um, to answer it nonetheless. So um, the universe started out in a very hot and dense state. Um, I think it was super energy and density, uh, energy and, and mass. And so you had um, uh, photons coming from the Big Bang. And um, initially the universe was very opaque to radiation because it was um, a plasma. I mean, at some point in time, the, the universe um, uh, became less opaque to radiation and you had the release of this, this radiation, which we now know as the cosmic microwave background. And through the expansion of the universe, this radiation cooled down. Instead of being the temperature of the plasma, it is now this really cold temperature, just a few degrees above absolute zero. And so we can measure this with um, modest detectors that are sensitive to um, microwave radiation. And there are lots of people here at Stanford designing those detectors. I'm not one of them. <laughs> But uh, yeah, <laughs> I think there's actually an excellent talk on this topic uh, in the, the uh, public lecture series uh, on the CMB. Yes, um, a couple of years ago. And there are actually very cool experiments that they're, they're doing um, around the geo geographical South Pole. So that team actually traveled to you know, Antarctica pretty frequently, which always makes me jealous. But yeah, um, we are going to do another uh, public lecture on CMB very soon, perhaps this fall. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, come here, yes. So I was looking at your paper with uh, Wang and Malin, uh, uh, was it 2020, and your Halo Tools uh, software suite on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that it assumes that all dark matter is particles, mm -hmm. but after the Ligo Virgo, results, the number of uh, uh, papers which contemplate um, most dark matters, black holes have increased 35 fold, and uh, including from uh, luminaries such as Professor Bernard Carr, the, the famous author of a number of literature reviews on dark matter and groups at uh, Yale and NASA. How, what would it take to convert your software simulation to accommodate uh, some proportion of dark matter being black holes. Okay, so that's a really interesting point. Um, so as I said, we don't know what dark matter is. And so of course, maybe it's black holes because black holes also don't emit much light. So they're actually pretty good candidates for dark matter. Now, there are various reasons for why we basically know that not all of the dark matter can be black holes that would react result in various effects that we could detect. So we know that not all of the dark matter is black holes. There's still the possibility that some dark matter could be in the form of black holes. Now this would, I think, be pretty easy to fold into those simulations because they would just act as another particle, right? A black hole is effectively a particle. It's size minuscule compared to the size of those simulations, as you know. So yeah, it'd be pretty straightforward uh, to put such um, alternative dark matter particles in those simulations, yes. And um, there are actually quite a lot of uh, very interesting questions online. One actually asking about the computational power. Um, this is one is from Jeff Corbett asking how much power do the simulations consume compared to mining cryptocurrency? <laughs> <laughs> I save this for that, you, you know. That that is a yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, and people have been thinking about this. If we think about the carbon footprint of astronomers, it turns out that simulations are a big part of it because they do consume a lot of energy. Now, let me do a quick calculation. I mean, if you run like a thousand computers for yeah a few weeks, yeah, you're looking at um, yeah a few giga gigawatt hours. Um, so I don't think they compare to cryptos because they're they're running like thousands of those farms across the world. Um, we're running a, yeah, a few <laughs> simulations, but I don't think it compares. We're not running them all the time, right? We have like some computer clusters that run them like a day in the month. Cool. So you're saying <laughs> that we can basically do do better. We can Good. do better. We can do yeah. We, we're always trying to do better there. <laughs> running. We want to develop more efficient codes that can do all this amplification in less, uh, less time and with less energy. Um, but yeah, it is, it is an important part of our 
carbon footprint. Yes. Sounds good. Um, okay, next question also from online. Um, this one is from um, Eric Levine asking, what accounts for the massive improvement in processing power over the last few decades, as you showed? Well, I think um, the big part is more efficient codes, but of course the other big part is just computers getting more efficient. We have more new CPUs coming with even smaller transistors and larger core counts and so they're able to process more operations in the same time. And so basically this, this curve I showed there of simulation size as a function of time looks a bit like Moore's law for computers, which tells you the size and computational power of CPUs. So that's basically also the main reason. Yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, could you explain what dark energy is in the system versus separate? Mm. <laughs> so, again, we don't really know what dark energy really is, but in the simplest form, it takes the form of a constant in Einstein's equations of generativity. And it basically acts as some form of negative gravity, it's like an anti gravity, basically. And so um, it's just, in the simplest theory, it just happens to be a property of space. And for whatever reason, has that particular value, that cosmological constant that ultimately gives rise to this expansion. But it's, I cannot really give you a physical explanation. It's really just like a property of space, something that enters into Einstein's field equation. And in fact, it's very interesting, the story of this uh, cosmological constant. Um, see, when Einstein first proposed his theory of generativity, applied to the whole universe. And he found that the universe couldn't be static, that it had to be either expanding or shrinking. And at that time, that was very contrary to what people assumed to be true. They thought the universe was just eternal and always the same. And so he took this constant, put it into his equation for the universe in order to, to be um, static, right? So that instead of it shrinking, it just has other concepts, contracts the shrinking, and that makes the universe static. It's kind of the story of the, the cosmological concept, which Einstein thought was a stupid idea afterwards, but now we still think it's true. Well, speaking of uh, hard questions, so there's one other hard question from online um, from Mike Warrett asking, okay, this is about uh, modified gravity, so you may hate it. Um, but <laughs> how do we know that there's just not a flaw in our understanding of gravity on the large scale? Mm. This is, a, this is a really, really important question because we have tested gravity quite accurately in the solar system, which is compared to the cosmological scale, it's really, really small. We're making a big extrapolation here. We suddenly take these laws of gravity and apply them to the entire universe. We don't do so lightly because again, we make Tesla predictions and so far everything turns out to be correct. But we are continuing testing modified models of gravity using large scale structure of the universe. We can look at the motions of galaxies and compare them against what's known as the gravitational lensing effect. By combining these two measurements, we can have some way to test our models of gravity. And so there are these, these theories of modified gravity we have simulations with these, and we're constantly eager to test them against what we observe in the universe. But so far, all the tests that we have performed tell us generativity seems to be right so far. Great. Um, OK. I know there are a couple more questions you guys want to ask, but Johannes uh, is go going to be here even after this event. So feel free to talk to him one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, but there's just one. Um, last uh, question that we can just wrap up this Q&A. Um, again, from online, um, from Michael Ross asking, uh, is Johannes um, and the team of working with or considering working with quantum computing organizations? <laughs> uh, no, so I can, no, as of now, no, we don't think about this. Um, in fact, um, 
have to say my, my line of research is uh, not involved in comparing simulations against data that we observe. Um, I don't, I don't run my the simulations myself very much, um, but I'm not aware of people considering quantum computers. We're definitely very far away from being able to really have a functioning quantum computer. Um, so yeah, that would be pure speculation. I don't actually know. Well, that's totally fine. Um, <laughs> I guess there's not I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's why we're having this lecture and Q and A. Um, great. Well, let's thank you, Hannes, again. Finally, to wrap up, uh, Brene is just going to tell us very quickly about uh, uh, several ways to follow KaiPak if you enjoy this lecture and if you want to hear more from us. So, Brene? <laughs> hey, sorry about that. <laughs> Internet is slow. So, hey, everyone. Um, thanks so much for attending, and I'm just going to sort of show you all kind of what we have on deck uh, here at KaiPak, if that's cool. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, cool. Can everyone see that? Cool. Yes. I'm just going to assume yes. Okay. So under Outreach Activities, you can kind of see our program overview. Right now, right, we have public lectures. We've also had telescope viewings, virtual K through 12 astronomy nights. If you know young high schoolers who are interested in physics, we have a Stanford program for inspiring the next generation of women in physics. Um, the applications are closed for this year, but they'll be open for 2023. Um, we're planning on having a community day at KaiPAC, uh, potentially maybe classroom visits sort of in the future as COVID policies evolve into a place where we can all be safe and just a ton of other things going on. So check out kaipac.stanford.edu slash outreach to learn all about all of the cool stuff that we have going on. And if you are feeling really dedicated, sign up for our outreach email list. Stay, stay connected with us. We don't spam, I promise. Um, we'll just sort of tell you about cool things that are coming up and just kind of ways to interact with, with folks on campus. Um, and if you are more social media minded, well, then good news, because we have a Twitter and we also have an Instagram where we <laughs> publicize this public lecture. And we also have a Facebook that I might have difficulty showing because I don't have Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> it worked. Um, and here's our uh, Facebook page for KaiPak. So yeah, whatever form of social media that you enjoy, except for TikTok, not TikTok yet, but <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our lovely mailing list. So yeah, don't be a stranger, stay in touch, and like hope to see you at the next event. Well, thanks so much, Brene. Um, yeah, so about our uh, next event, we are actually going to take a break uh, in August. Typically, we have these uh, monthly lecture series uh, on the first Tuesday of the month, but we are hoping to get back uh, in early September. And um, you actually get to say um, on what you want us to talk about next. So a few things that we already sort of have a lineup, uh, which is talking about the James Webb Space Telescope for scientific results. Um, we're going to talk more about uh, CMB, uh, a little bit more about high energy astrophysics, more in X-ray or gamma ray, and why do we even need them? Um, so if you're interested in learning anything more than that, um, we would love to hear from you. So tomorrow you'll be receiving a follow-up email um, and also a survey um, just telling us how you feel about this event, um, whether there's anything that we could do better and tell us what you want to hear from us. So uh, yeah, I guess with that, um, I would like to bring everybody back again on screen, making sure that you're showing your face, uh, making it on time. Um, Yes, so I hope everyone enjoyed today's event and uh, do hope to see you again at some point. Thank you very much.
Hello. Uh, so, how do you know what reality looks like now? Because first, 